All right. Zechariah 12 tonight. So the next two weeks, we're not going to do that. We're never going to get done with Zechariah because next week, of course, is members meeting. <clears throat> the week after that, we're probably going to let the Ecuador team come and just, you know, share about the trip and all that happened and, you know, what God did. Uh, that, that's, that's beneficial. And so that, that'll be an encouragement to all of our hearts. Um, Zechariah 12 through 14 uh, begins foretelling, uh, the foretelling of events that are far future in, from the people's perspective. Remember, uh, context of Zechariah, they're building, rebuilding Jerusalem and their uh, spiritual slump. They stop building. Zechariah and Haggai come to uh, prophesy to them to encourage them to begin building again. Uh, and, and we've walked through all of the visions of Zechariah in the first eight chapters. We walked through the oracles of Zechariah. And this final, uh, the final, I guess you could say couple of oracles, actually 12 and 12 through 14 is really one big narrative unit. So all these chapters go together. And, and of course, they foretell the events of God's salvation in Christ, the events surrounding the end and the new heavens and the new earth. And, and all of the future events. But before we begin the final or oracles of Zechariah in 12 through 14, I, I want to kind of give you a road map of where we're going, where we're headed, because these three chapters really all go together. And the fact is, we're going to do 12 tonight. It's going to be two weeks before we do 13. Uh, and then the, presumably the next week we'll do 14. So it seems like we're taking them in disconnected chunks, but they're not disconnected. So let me give you a quick um, overview of how this looks. Now, there's a lot of debate about how these should be interpreted, about how these prophetic pictures are to be understood. So chapter 12, what we're going to do tonight, begins with a battle in which the Lord completely delivers his people, completely. The second half of chapter 12 shows the repentance and the mourning of his people as they turn to Jesus. It says uh, they will look at the one whom they've pierced and they will mourn and weep and wail. And then chapter 13 begins, we're going to look at the first verse of chapter 13 tonight. Um, it begins by saying a fountain of salvation will be opened uh, to God's people then. And hearts will change in chapter 13. Idolatry will cease from the land. Uh, and it says uh, all that will happen as the shepherd is struck and the sheep are scattered. Um, uh, another image that we're probably familiar with. And then chapter 14, another battle where half of the people uh, of Jerusalem go into exile and the Lord himself will come bringing salvation and new heavens, new earth. And that's how the, that's how the book ends. These chapters are fiercely debated as to their actual meaning. There's several, several different modes of interpretation that are used in these chapters. So I'm going to give you a couple. Uh, if you want, I'll tell you what I think, but I, I'm just a guy like everybody else. What we're going to do is we're going to focus more on the truths that they teach and the application for us. So make sure you understand we don't all have to agree on the specific timeline or the fulfillment of these pictures. The actual application is going to be the same, whether you view it one way or view it the other. God's going to bring judgment and salvation. God's going to protect his people. There's a future eternal hope in Jesus. Y'all with me? Okay, so with all that said, chapter 11 ended really on a sour note, didn't it? God declared through Zechariah that the covenant was broken as Zechariah broke the staffs. You know, one symbolizes the unity and the other was, uh, what was it, favor, grace. Uh, and he was, he was modeling the true shepherd God would send. And then he says, I'm done with you people. And they hated him. And he broke the staffs. And then God foretold that he would raise a false shepherd who would not care for the sheep. And after chapter 11 ends, if, if Zechariah ended in chapter 11, you might think, man, that was terrible. You know, like God is angry. Um, and the people may be asking now, you know, is that it? You know, is that the final word? Uh, are we cast off forever now that Zechariah broke his, his, broke, his broke, cracked his staffs? <laughs> the answer to the question is a resounding no. 
Zechariah now in 12 begins foretelling of the salvation and the deliverance that God will bring to his people in the far future. So what I want to do is I want to read all of chapter 12 because there are things along the lines uh, down in chapter 12 that are going to help us to see the uh, interpretations of the first part. Okay? So... And I got a lot tonight, so I may not take many questions, but if you got one that you really want to answer, just throw your hand up and we'll, we'll talk about it. The oracle of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. Behold, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. The siege of Jerusalem will be also, against, also be against Judah. On that day, you'll see that phrase over and over and over and over again through these three chapters. On that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves, and all the nations of the earth will gather against it. On that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness. But for the sake of the house of Judah, I will keep my eyes open when I strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. Then the clans of Judah, some of your translations may say leaders of Judah, shall say to themselves, the inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength through the Lord of hosts, their God. On that day, I will make the clans of Judah, or leaders of Judah, like a blazing pot in the midst of wood, like a flaming torch among the sheaves, and they shall devour to the right and to the left all the surrounding peoples, while Jerusalem shall again be inhabited in its place in Jerusalem. Uh, NIV doesn't have Jerusalem there twice, but it is in the original text. And the Lord will give salvation to the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem may not be surpassed, may not surpass that of Judah. On that day, the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them on that day shall be like David and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. And on that day, I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace. I think it should be the spirit of grace. And pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on him whom they've pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day, the morning in Jerusalem will be as great as the morning for, it could be of or in Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. The land shall mourn each family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by himself. But, and their wives by themselves. And then uh, the family of the house of Levi. All these families by themselves. And then 13.1 says, On that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. That's where William Cowper's hymn comes from. There's a fountain filled with blood, in case you're wondering. So the oracle begins with a declaration of God's omnipotence, his creative power, and his sovereignty over all things. He says, Oracle of the word of the Lord, thus declares the Lord who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. He is the creator. He's the creator of heaven and earth. And he introduces this, this future prophecy by reminding that he is the creator, the sustainer. Uh, he's the one who created man and formed the spirit of man within him. With this statement, God is showing that he is able to accomplish his will. He's able to fulfill his promises. He alone created all things, including man. So he is Lord of all things. The judgment and the salvation foretold here comes about because of God's mighty power and his hand over all things. And then God promises to confound the nations that set themselves up against his people. Two through four. We're going to camp out here for just a little while. Behold, I'm about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to the surrounding peoples. Siege of Jerusalem will be against Judah. On that day I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves. And all the nations of the earth will gather against it. On that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with panic... And it's rider with madness, but for the sake of the house of Judah, I will keep my eyes open when I strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. Now, 
There are several different views on this scene. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the several, and then I'm going to tell you what I think if you care. If you don't care, I'm not going to go into it. So, <clears throat> one view is that this was fulfilled in the time of the Maccabees as the Israel's victory over them. But there, in my opinion, there are several issues that make that very unlikely. Uh, not least of which is we don't have any account that looks like this. Um, others claim that it's a reference to the siege of Jerusalem by Rome and all the auxiliary nations coming against Jerusalem in AD 70. That can't be right either. Uh, because this is not foretelling the destruction of Jerusalem. It's, it's telling its deliverance, right? So, and of course, you know, I know some of y'all thinking this. Some see the, the battle of Armageddon. You know, here is the, the, the end time battle. The nation is coming against Jerusalem. But the problem is this isn't the same battle as foretold in Zechariah 14 before the coming of the Lord. In Zechariah 14, Jerusalem is ravaged. And half of it goes into exile before the Lord actually comes down and, you know, his feet stand on the Mount of Olives and all that. So, and, and besides that, if we, if we read this strictly as an end time battle, this particular section of chapter 12, I mean, we got a problem of the nations attacking on horseback. You know, I mean, Israel's pretty, you know, a couple tanks and planes to be able to take them out. And the horses can't be just Zechariah's way of describing future military equipment that he doesn't have the words to describe because he says God's going to deliver Jerusalem by specifically blinding and panicking the horses. So the fulfillment here in chapter 12 is very elusive. Um, I'm going to give you what I think, my take on it, um, and I'm going to tell you how I arrive at my conclusion but just know, you need to know right up front, especially as we walk into chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, um, there is no, you know what eschatology is? The end times, study of the end times, eschat, eschatos means last, eschatology. There's no eschat, eschatological system that doesn't have problems. So there's hard verses for me to interpret, there's hard verses for, if you're a dispensationalist, whatever to interpret, none that are without its problems. So we can't divide over this. We can't go to war over whose end times theory is, or interpretation is, is the absolute correct one. And all of us, including myself, we have to hold our views with, with a bit of humility. So I'm going to tell you all through this, it could be this, it could be that, I'm going to do different views. Uh, these things have been debated for centuries, and so we're not going to get them all solved here tonight, probably. I mean, maybe, but, you know, who knows? <laughs> really, in my mind, there are only two views that are possible for these verses and this battle that we're seeing here. The first is 12 through 14 shows a battle, an actual battle, and the conversion of ethnic Israel in the time leading up to the coming of Christ. It's not the end time battle. It's not the Armageddon or anything. It's uh, the precursor to the conversion of Israel. That is possible and that is valid. Uh, although you still, have the, you still have the nations coming, uh, waging war on, her, on horseback. Um, the second view is that 12 through 14 prophesies the, the coming of the new covenant salvation. And this is a picture of the true perfected Israel of God who are in Christ. The remnant of Israel that's foretold all through the prophets. Now, for me, my opinion, which you don't have to hold and I'm not going to fork down your throat. For me, the deciding factor is how the New Testament apostles interpreted the fulfillment of the covenant promises in Christ and the true remnant of Israel. Jesus is the true Israel, and his people are those who are in him. So God is foretelling his salvation of the true Israel in a way that would encourage and strengthen the people in Zechariah's day. It is for Israel. It is for the true Israel. Ultimately, these prophecies are pr applicable and encouraging to the people of God Generally, So regardless of the timeline or the specific view that you hold, uh, the application is the same. Um, uh, so 
we don't have to divide over it. We're talking about the salvation of our God. We're talking about the new heavens, new earth. We're talking about all of those things. The application is the same for us as it was for them. Uh, wh whether we hold this view or that view is that judgment and salvation is coming. It's only through Christ and there's an eternal reward. Now, would you like me to elaborate on what leads me to my conclusion in the verses in the New Testament? Or do you want me to just move on because the application is the same? It's up to y'all. You sure? You want me to elaborate? Man, I was afraid y'all was going to say that. <laughs> All right. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promises. He is the true Israel, the perfect Israel. I do not believe that the church replaces Israel. The Gentiles are grafted into the remnant of Israel by Christ. So after, listen, after Jesus rose again in the early chapters of Acts... The entire worldwide church was Jewish. All of them. There were no Gentiles there. Everybody in the people of Christ in the first eight chapters of Acts, which spans a lot of years, everybody was Jewish. And they saw themselves as the true Israel, the remnant that is foretold in all of the prophets. That's why Paul could say in Romans 9, not all Israel are part of Israel. Uh, the, those Jews in Christ were the remnant and they saw themselves that way. Even, you know, the 12 apostles presented themselves as the, the leaders of the perfected 12 tribes of Israel as they walked out into Pentecost. I mean, it was, they saw themselves as the remnant. So you have, look, the picture is you have ethnic Israel as a whole, like the Jewish people. You're, you, you get in by your bloodline. Your mom and daddy Jewish, you're Jewish and you're part of the people of Israel. And then within that group, after Christ came, there's a remnant right in the middle of all Jewish people, ethnic Jewish people who, are, who trusted in Jesus. They are God's remnant, the perfected Israel who received the new covenant promises, who the prophets foretold, all of those things. Then, and then in that remnant, fulfilling the covenant promise to Abraham, Gentiles were grafted into that remnant by grace through faith. So in Romans 11, Paul uses the picture of an olive tree to represent the people of God, Israel. And he says, ethnic Jews who rejected Christ are said to be broken off of that tree. And Gentiles in Christ are said to be grafted onto that tree. But there's only one tree. And based on Romans 11, I believe with all my heart, before the end actually comes, there's going to be a mass conversion of sure enough ethnic Jews that come to Christ. There's going to be a mass of them. And they will again, as Paul says in Romans 11, be grafted back into the tree. And many, uh, full disclosure, many people see the grafting back in of the ethnic Jews to be what's happening here in this and they're mourning for those who peer, those who appear and that's fine that's that's a valid viewpoint I, I really it very well could be um, but there's only one tree and Jews were cut off some were cut off others were grafted in and he tells the Gentiles there in Romans 11, don't you be boasting because you've been grafted in because God can graft them back in again. And he will. And in this way, he said, in this way, all Israel will be saved. And so um, with us, when they are, if end times is coming and a mass of ethnic Jews turn to Christ, as I believe will happen based on those scriptures I mentioned, um, when they turn to Christ, they're going to be part of us. You know, we're going to be brothers and sisters, the people of God, uh, the remnant of God. What Paul calls in Galatians, the Israel of God. Ephesians 2, 11 through 22 teaches this. So let me just read you these verses. Or sorry, Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. So it's actually 11 through 22. I'm just going to read 14. He says, he's talking about Jew and Gentile. He said, you Gentiles were far off from the commonwealth of Israel and for the co from the covenant promise. And then he says, and now you've been brought near. He says, for he himself is our peace who has made us both. He means Jews and Gentiles and who has made us both one 
and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law and commandments expressed in ordinances. Look at it. That he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both. He's talking about Jew and Gentile to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And if you turn, I don't have it on the screen, but you know, for uh, uh, First Peter two nine uses the exact same language Exodus nineteen uses of Israel when Moses is talking about the people of God, the people who are in Christ. He said, "You are a royal priesthood." He called them a holy nation. Uh, he used all the four or five different things that were right out of Exodus to call them that. And so, uh, oh, I have it written. But you are a chosen race, he says to the church, 1 Peter 2.9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Each one of those designations was used by Moses in Exodus 19. And you're going to love this. You know, don't throw tomatoes at me. I'm not trying to convince you. I'm just trying to give you the other side. The perfected Jerusalem, the true end time Jerusalem are the citizens of the new Jerusalem, the actual city that will actually come down out of heaven in the new heavens and new earth. And the reason I think that is because we're going to get there eventually. We're starting Hebrews 12 Sunday. He tells in Hebrews, he's, he's writing to Hebrews, to Hebrew Christians. And all through this Hebrews, he's told them, don't go back to that temple. Don't go back to making them sacrifices. Don't go back to that high priest. And he says, you have come, not will come, not hopefully one day, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal gatherings, to the assembly of the firstborn, and on and on and on. But he tells them, you are God's people, telling these Hebrew Christians, don't go back to all that. You are God's people. You have come to Zion right now, the heavenly Jerusalem. And then in Galatians 4, which we walked through a long time ago, he's talking about Hagar and Sarah. He says this. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. This is Paul speaking to the Galatians. These two women, Hagar and Sarah, are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. The, she corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above, he's talking about the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven. She's free, and she is our mother. Now, I understand that that, you know, I threw a lot of verses at you a lot at one time. I would be lying to you if I said there are no interpretive problems with my view at all. I have the perfect view and every other view. There are problems with every view that you have to wrestle with when we're talking about eschatology. But like I said, you know, this has been debated for 2,000 years. Um, and I don't feel like, I, I, I don't believe I'm called to take up the mantle of, as an apologist for some particular end times view. So. I'm not here to convince you of nothing. I just want you to know where I'm coming from. I didn't want you to think, well, Jason, just don't take the Bible seriously. I hope you know me long enough to know that's not true. Any questions? Don't ask no questions, please. <laughs> that's a lot to take in, I understand. But I'm not going to, as we walk through 12, 13, 14, I understand that there are probably a lot of different end times views in here. And I... Honestly, the application of this text, these texts are the same, so I'm not going to press one or the other, or I'm going to try to show you the overarching application, and I'm going to make mention. This view says this, this view says this, this view says this, and you go study to show yourself approved, and you, you, you decide for yourself, as I had to do, okay? Whatever, t whatever you take, application is the same. We're told in this verse, these verses, we're told God will make his people an obstacle, a stumbling block to the world. He says, I'm about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to the surrounding peoples. The siege of Jerusalem will be against Judah. So it's not just the city of Jerusalem. He's talking about either the land of Judah or the clan of Judah. One of the two. We just, we don't know for sure. And of course, Jesus being the representative of Judah. On that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all peoples and all who lift it will surely hurt themselves. 
and all the nations of the earth will gather against it. You know, all through history, we, all through history, from the beginning, from, from Genesis 3 all the way to Revelation 20, uh, Satan and the world system have waged war against God's people and his purposes. And you have to be blind to not see it getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. So from Cain and Abel all the way to the end. Yet here God says he's going to make his people a cup of staggering and a heavy stone. Here, God's given a promise that his people are so firm in their foundation, so protected under his hand, that when they're attacked, you know, whether we're talking about end time battle or whether we're talking about today, right now, as his people are attacked, they're protected under his hand. The attackers themselves, he says, will suffer harm. The nations uh, decide that they're going to just drink up God's people like wine, but God says that the cup that they're drinking will make them stagger, meaning it's going to knock them back. They will never consume God's people entirely. They might kill some here and there, but the people of God will continue and those who attack them will suffer harm in this life or the next. And in another symbolic picture, he says they will be a heavy stone. I'm going to make them like a big stone. And, and when the world tries to lift them out of the way, like as one would remove an obstacle, they're only going to hurt themselves trying to do so. God's people are an impediment to the world. They desire to get God's people out of the way. You know, they want, the world wants to remove the salt and light that shines in their darkness. But there's a sign over God's people saying, attack them at your own risk. There will always be persecution. There will always be those who suffer and are killed for the faith, martyrs. But God's people as a whole will never be cast down, will never be destroyed. Jesus said, the gates of hell will prevail against my church. Because whether providentially or miraculously, God himself will protect his people. One of the most fascinating things in history, you know, and right now we're speaking just specifically of, of the church, church history, is that all the way back in the beginning, whenever God's word and people came under attack, you know, early church history is, I just love reading about it and learning about it. Whenever God's people came under attack, those were the times where the church grew the most, where the gospel went forth the most. One of the early church fathers, his name was Tertullian. He said something you've probably heard, the blood of the martyrs is the... Okay, maybe you haven't. <laughs> blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. You ever heard that? Tertullian said that. Now you know. No one's half the battle. What he said is that, uh, that even when the world and God's enemies were raging against the truth, killing people, you know, Saul was dragging people out of their houses, the gospel continued to grow. People continued to come to know Christ, even in the first three centuries when Christianity was an illegal religion. And the remnant of God's people grew in Christ. No matter what horrific display of depravity the world can devise, the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. Believe that? Okay. Verse 4. On that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness. But for the sake of the house of Judah, I will keep my eyes open when I strike every horse of the people with blindness. Once again, we have on that, you're going to see on that day, like 15 times through the rest of the book. When judgment and salvation collide on the day, the Lord, on that day, the Lord will fight for his people. The picture here is God blinding the horses. So the idea, the, the image of this comes from 1 Kings 6. You probably know that story. It's when Elijah was surrounded by the horsemen and the chariots of Syria um, and remember the guys next to him, he says, there's nobody going to help us. And God, he prays for God to open his eyes and he could see the, all the, the army of the Lord. And then after that, Elijah prayed and God made the enemy army blind. And God does the same here. In Zechariah's day, a cavalry was one of the most formidable weapons in battle. So what this is, is a picture of an entire army all on horseback. A whole army of just cavalry, 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 horses. 
So the whole, this is not just a big mighty army and then they have their cavalry that's going to, this is all of them. This army is on horseback and that is a formidable, unheard of force. But with a single word, God blinds them all, throws them into a panic. The point here is a very powerful one for God's people facing opposition of the world or, or, or powerful governments or whatever. There's no need to fear. The world has no power against the authority of the one true God. Zero. Every persecution that comes to God's people, every, every martyr that is, is brought to death, uh, God has allowed it for a purpose. Peter, James, Paul, they all tell us to rejoice in our sufferings because God is using them for our growth and His kingdom. We shouldn't be surprised that the world is getting more and more and more hostile to Christ. We were told that that would happen. 2 Timothy 3.12 All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. He warned us it's going to get bad, worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. But we don't have to cower in fear or compromise the truth. The omnipotent God can deliver us anytime He wishes. And we're called to stand for the truth and the gospel of the kingdom, knowing that our message, our Messiah, will grow more and more distasteful to the world. And as we see it, verse 4, man, I'm, I'm moving really slow here. I'm going to have to speed up. We also see that God watches over his people. That's a, a beautiful verse in verse 4. He says, right at the end of it, it says, But for the sake of the house of Judah, I will keep my eyes open when I strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. He says, I'll keep my eyes open. While he blinds the horses, God says, I'm going to keep my eyes open, meaning I'm going to be watching my people. I'm going to have my eye on them. You know, the people of God are protected under his care. Even death and persecution can do nothing to alter the status that we've been given in Christ and the power of our God's hand. So the first four verses deal really with just the protection of God's people. Wherever you think it, the fulfillment is, whether it's in the end time or whether it's just the people of God in, in the church, the Israel of God. It, what we're seeing is the protection of God's people. Zechariah spoke these words to the returned exiles in, in, in Jerusalem, rebuilding the city. He was foretelling this to awaken them, to encourage them, to, to move them out of their spiritual stupor and say, God is going to be with you. He's going to protect you. He's going to fight for you. And, but we know from Nehemiah that they were still in a sad spiritual state even years later. But that doesn't have to be the case with us. We can rejoice and be encouraged even though the world is continually attacking God and his people. Our God is able and none can overthrow his purposes. And then in five and six, he's going to show us God's protection in the strength that he will provide for his people. He says, then the clans of Judah shall say to themselves, the inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength through the Lord of hosts. Some of you, in your translations say the leaders of Judah. Really? None? Yeah, Scots does. Okay. Uh, governors of Judah? Yeah, it could be. It, it just depends. The word can mean both. We're not sure which one it is. The idea is either that the people themselves are given strength uh, or the leaders that lead the people are given strength. You know, that whole thing about uh, bad shepherds and all that we saw in the last, uh, in the last chapter is uh, being reversed. But ultimately, he says, on that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a blazing pot in the midst of wood. He pictures them. This is a picture, a symbol of, of fire, a flaming torch among the sheaves. And that fire will spread out and devour to the right and to the left the surrounding people. So he's picturing the people as, as torches, as fire that is sweeping out from their consuming the surrounding peoples while, and I love, this verse is amazing, while Jerusalem shall again be inhabited in its place in Jerusalem. I'll tell you what that, I'll tell you why that's amazing in a minute. So he shows really where our strength comes from. He says the clans of Judah could also be the leaders of Judah, governors of Judah, Jesus being the representative of the tribe of Judah, will know that their strength comes from the Lord of hosts. 
That's what he says. He says, they will, they will know. Jerusalem have strength to the Lord of hosts. The inhabit- they will say the inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength through the Lord of hosts. They will know that their strength comes from the Lord. God will strengthen his people by his own might, and they will know that their strength comes from him. The same is true for us today. Our strength doesn't come from our own goodness, our own determination, our own will, our own anything. Our strength comes from the grace and power of God who has given us perfection through the blood of His Son and indwells us by His Holy Spirit. And this strength, he says, will will blaze as a fire before all of those who oppose Christ and His people. The people themselves are pictured as as a raging fire that devours all that's around, you know, Ultimately, I, I see this as, a pic, uh, as the, the people of God going forth with the gospel. You know, the gospel will consume all people either in salvation or in judgment. Uh, others have a different view of that. You know, and they talk about, you know, the, the picture of fire being one of, of bringing people into, you know, consuming them into the people of Israel. Others say they're just killing everybody. You know, there's a lot of different views on that. God will give his people strength to fight the battle. That's basically the application. And God will provide security for his people. But the end of verse 6 is just absolutely amazing. He says, they're going to do this. They're going to, while Jerusalem shall again be inhabited in its place in Jerusalem. Literally, the text says, I had to go translate it from Hebrew this morning just to make sure I was right. It says, Jerusalem will dwell again in its place in Jerusalem. That's an amazing statement. Zechariah is calling the people themselves Jerusalem. And he's saying, Jerusalem, the people, Jerusalem, will inhabit the place, Jerusalem. So if you have a New American Standard Bible, it says the inhabitants of Jerusalem will dwell on their own sites in Jerusalem. And the New English translation says then the people of Jerusalem will. But that's not what the text says. I mean, that is what the text means. But what it says is Jerusalem will inhabit Jerusalem. He's calling the people themselves Jerusalem. So they see it as the people. The, these translations see it as the people as well. But it doesn't say the people of or the inhabitants of For Zechariah, Jerusalem is a people as well as a place. And the people are secure in their place. They're united in the Lord. That's amazing to me. I'm sorry. Y'all with me? Everybody good? Don't be flattening my tires when I leave. (laughs) Seven and eight. And the Lord will give salvation to the... This This is very, very strange and hard to interpret. The Lord will give salvation to the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem may not surpass that of Judah. On that day, the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them on that day shall be like David. And the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. And on that day, I'll seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. It's very, very difficult, very strange. So caused a lot of discussion and debate. You know, I've got five commentaries on Zechariah. All five have a different opinion about what it means. Um, He says Judah will be saved before Jerusalem, before the inhabitants of Jerusalem, before the house of David, so that the house of David won't be more glorified than Judah. Do you see that? Am Am I saying that right? Yeah, so that they will not be more glorified than Judah. Um... And then he says, all God's people will be like the house of David. I think he means the people brought into the covenant God made with the house of David. They won't be, you know, they won't be lesser. You say it that way. Um, Some take it to mean that. No, that's not right. I can't remember. I'm just going to tell you what I think it means. I don't know. That help? (laughs) What I do know is overall, I can't tell you what each figure means and what, how it, the Judah and the house of David, other than the fact that, you know, it, 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 salvation could be moving in, you know, pictures of land, land of Judah, land of Jerusalem, salvation moving in. But that doesn't seem to be right because he's talking about uh, the feeblest among them will be like David. So he's talking about the people. He's not talking about the land. Um, and so... 
are we talking about salvation in Christ? Uh, are we talking about deliverance from what's going on, the, the oppression that's going on? I can't be sure. I can't be sure, and I, I'm not going to be dogmatic when I'm not sure. Um, doesn't sound like I've been too dogmatic all the way through this, really. But what I can tell you is that every single one of God's people, from the feeblest to the most powerful, will be equally His people. There will not be different classes of believer who have greater or lesser access to God as King David did uh, and all the others had to, you know, all the others didn't. And there's not going to be different levels of covenant promises. You know, God made a covenant promise with Abraham with all of Abraham's children. But God also made a covenant with David that he would rule and he would reign and somebody would sit on his throne forever. He said they will all be like the house of David. And, and he will supernaturally empower uh, uh, there was, God will supernaturally empower them so that the same spirit guides them just like the angel of the Lord guided them with a pillar of cloud and pillar of fire in the Exodus. So each member of God's people will, in my opinion, he's talking about being imbued with the spirit, being imbued with the covenant promises, and even the lowest of God's people has the full measure of the spirit and the communion with God to lead the people if, if God so calls him to do so. Okay? All right. That's as good as I got. So verses 1 through 9 is one section. Shows us protection, deliverance of God's people against the world. Uh, 10 through 14, we're going to go through this really quick. It's very, very short. It's going to show us how God will change the heart. So the battle's being fought against the world on the outside. 1 through 9, it's going to be fought on the inside with 10 through 14. How he's going to change the hearts of his people. And he foretells, the, in my opinion, the essential elements of the new covenant as he changes hearts and pours out his spirit upon them. Verses 10 11. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace. There is, okay, in Hebrew and Greek, if the word doesn't have. Um, an article in front of it, like A is an article or the is an article, it's usually taken as A something. Uh, but sometimes with proper nouns, it doesn't have to have one to be the. I think it's the, I think he's talking about not just, hey, we have a spirit of grace. I think he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Uh, the spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look upon me, look at the, look at the change in pronouns. When they, God says, when they look upon me, on him who they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day, the mourning in Jerusalem will be as great <clears throat> as the mourning for Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. So God, what the, God's going to give them repentant hearts, a spirit of grace and the spirit of mercy so that they will mourn over him who has spirits. He will pour out his spirit, the spirit, I think, uh, and they look upon him who pierce shall mourn. This text is actually quoted in John 19, 37, and John claims the fulfillment of it is at the crucifixion. He says, this is John 34 through 37, he talks about the spear in the side, and then he says, for these, verse 36, for these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled, not one of his bones will be broken, and another scripture says, they will look on him who they pierced. Um, some take it that way. There is, in full disclosure, I told you I was going to give you both viewpoints, the same John who wrote John also wrote Revelation. And there he says, behold, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. So could be a future, could be a future thing that we're talking about here. Very possible. Uh, but they will wail on account of him. But right here, it, it, it's not, Revelation says the, the tribes of the earth will wail. It's not the nations wailing here. It is the inhabitants of Jerusalem. It's Judah. But either way, Zechariah foretells that when the Spirit's poured out, they will mourn over him who they pierced. They will weep bitterly. This is the conviction of the gospel, whether we're talking about in the end time or whether we're talking about just in the, in the salvation of the Lord, uh, that the Spirit brings in salvation. The mourning is pictured as just as intense as one who mourns the death of an only child. That's not just regular kind of sorrow. That's gut-wrenching, painful sorrow. 
And he compares their conviction, their mourning, to the people who, um, the mourning of the people of Israel when the godly king Josiah was killed. That's what he means. Uh, Hadad Ramon can either be a person's name or a place name. So a lot of your translations may have different things like mourning at Hadad in the plain of Megiddo or mourning of Hadad in the plain of Megiddo, meaning this guy was mourning in the plain of Megiddo when, uh, when Josiah the great king was killed. Um, so, very well could be. This, this could be, you know, a lot of people take this as the national mourning that will take place at the end when ethnic Jews in mass turn to Christ. It's very possible, very well could be. Uh, but Zechariah makes, plain, uh, makes pains to say that their mourning will be isolated to houses and families. Uh, this morning will not take place in a big gathering of national assembly. So he says, last verses we'll read almost. The land shall mourn each family by itself. Family of the house of David by itself. And their wives by themselves. The family of the house of Nathan by itself. And their wives by themselves. The family, and it keeps going on and on and on and on. All of these people by themselves. So it's everybody mourning. But they're mourning personally. You, know, you remember how Israel in the Old Testament, you know, when something would go on, you know, as a nation, they would just tear their clothes, sackcloth. This is not that. This is a heart mourning. Each individual's broken inside and mourning inside when they realize uh, what it means that Jesus, the one they pierced, uh, truly is the Messiah, uh, I believe. Anyway, um, and then the last verse. <clears throat> On that day, there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from their sin and uncleanness. What do you think that fountain is? Yeah, Jesus is always the right answer. <laughs> so, and then chapter 13 is going to go on in detail to talk about their repentance of heart, their turning from idolatry. It's going to take place. Even saying in chapter 13, verse 7, that the shepherd is going to be struck and the sheep will be scattered. A text which both Matthew and Mark say is fulfilled when Jesus was killed. These are very, very difficult texts to interpret. A whole set of books have been written to put forth one view or another on these two chapters. So what I want to focus on is regardless of where you see the direct fulfillment, I'm, I'm not here to tell you this or that or whatever. I have my own view and that's it. The application is the same. The judgment, the salvation of God through his Messiah is a reality and it's coming. One day it will be here in physical form. One day it will be here when the Lord returns physically, personally. Every eye will see him. Uh, and, um, and that'll be it. Judgment, salvation, new heavens, new earth. The world, up until then, whether we're talking about it right now, whether we're talking about a thousand years from now, whether we're talking about two weeks until the actual end of history, the world will always be opposed to God. Always. But God is sovereign to bring about His will, and He has provided a way of salvation for His people through the one whom we pierced. Questions, comments? I'm not saying cries of outrage because there may be some tonight. <laughs> yes. This makes me think of today. I mean, really every nation is against Israel. All the surrounding nations. Yeah. We never thought it would happen in America until now. We never thought it would happen in America? Like. Oh, okay. She said it reminds her of today when all nations are against Israel. You know, and, and all that. Yeah. Uh, I, look, I can't deny Romans 11 that says, I believe, that there is going, before the end, there's going to be a mass conversion of truly ethnic Jews, truly ethnic Israel. I don't doubt that. And the, the world's hatred for the state of Israel, I mean, that's documented history from forever. You know, there's always, always. So indeed, that's true as well. Anybody else? Okay, let's pray. 
Father, we do love you, and I thank you for your word. God, Zechariah is filled with prophecies and pictures and things that are very difficult to interpret, and many have said many different things. God, we just want to know what you have to tell us today about us. God, I pray that you would help us to see whether, you know, whatever view we hold about eschatology or the, the prophetic pictures, God, I pray that you would just... Um, that you would just nail into our minds and imprint upon our hearts the reality that whatever, whatever it is that is to come, we know that we are, uh, we are safe, we are um, under your protection, and that no suffering, no anything comes to us that doesn't pass through your hands. So many will suffer, and we will suffer in this life, but God, we can do so with hope. We can do so without being... Um, without being downtrodden. We can do so without being fearful uh, because we know that you are in control of all things, God, and we know that we are your people through Jesus Christ, through the gospel. Uh, we don't have to work. We don't have to act. We don't have to do anything to increase our standing or our merit before you. Jesus has done it all, and we can rest in that no matter what the future holds. God, we thank you for that. God, we thank you for your gospel. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray.